we begin chapter 19 of Matthew's Gospel today. And it begins with a bang. Immediately, some dicey subjects arise. Dicey for first century Jewish community, and they remain problematic for God worshipers to our day. The subjects are divorce, monogamy, and celibacy. And before we're through with this section, I have little doubt I'm going to bother most of you and possibly offend some of you. Because facing what the Bible actually has to say and does not say about these subjects makes it challenging, it makes it well out of step with today's Western society perspectives and customs, and that includes some branches of Christianity. Now before I say any more, let's open our Bibles and we're going to read Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. Follow along with me. When Yeshua had finished talking about these things, He left the Galil, the Galilee, traveled down the east side of the Jordan River until He passed the border of Judah, Judea. And great crowds followed Him, and He healed them there. <clears throat> some Parashim, some Pharisees, came and tried to trap Him by asking, Is it permitted for a man to divorce his wife on any ground whatsoever? And He replied, haven't you read that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female, and that He said, For this reason a man should leave his father and mother and be united with his wife, and the two are to become one flesh? Thus they are no longer two, but one. So then, no one should split apart what God has joined together. And they said to Him, Then why did Moshe give the commandment that a man should hand his wife a get and divorce her? And he answered, Moshe allowed you to, to divorce your wives because your hearts are so hardened. But this is not how it was at the beginning. Now what I say to you is <clears throat> that whoever divorces his wife except on the ground of sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. And the disciples said to him, Well, if that's how things are between husband and wife, it would be better not to marry. And he said to them, Not everyone grasps this teaching, only those for whom it's meant. For there are different reasons why men do not marry. Some because they were born without the desire, some because they have been castrated, some because they have renounced marriage for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Whoever can grasp this, let him do so. Then children were brought to him so that he might lay hands on them and pay, pray for them. But the Talmudim, the disciples rebuked the people, bringing them. However, Yeshua said, Let the children come to me. Don't stop them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And then, after laying his hands on them, he went on his way. A man approached Yeshua and said, Rabbi, what good thing should I do in order to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why are you asking me about good? There is one who is good. But if you want to obtain eternal life, Observe the mitzvot, observe the commandments. <clears throat> and the man asked, Well, which ones? And Yeshua said, Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't give false testimony, honor father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said to him, Well, I've kept all these. Where do I fall short? Yeshua said to him, If you are serious about reaching the goal, go and sell your possessions, give to the poor, and you will have riches in heaven. Then Come follow me. But when the young man heard this, he went away sad because he was wealthy. Then Yeshua said to his Talmudim, Yes, I tell you, it will be very hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Furthermore, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to pass through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And when the Talmudim heard this, they were utterly amazed. Then who, they asked, can be saved? Yeshua looked at them and said, Humanly, this is impossible, but with God everything is possible. Kepha, as Peter, replied and said, Look, 
We've left everything and followed you, so what will we have? And Yeshua said to them, Yes, I tell you that in the regenerated world, when the Son of Man sits on His glorious throne, you who have followed Me will also sit on twelve thrones and judge the twelve tribes of Israel. Everyone who has left houses, brothers, sisters, father, mother, children, or fields for My sake will receive a hundred times more, and he will obtain eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. The setting is this. Yeshua determines it's time for him to leave the Galilee where he has done nearly all of his ministry work. Thus, he is completing the bulk of his teaching of his twelve disciples, although it's going to continue. And he will not return to the Galilee in the flesh. The next time we find him in the Galilee is in a somewhat altered form <clears throat> after his crucifixion and resurrection. Now, the book of Mark offers a similar narrative beginning in chapter 10. Let's read it to get his perspective. We're going to read the first 12 verses of Mark chapter 10. So turn over to Mark chapter 10. We're going to read the first 12 verses. Follow along with me, please. Then Yeshua left that place and went into the regions of Judah and the territory beyond the Jordan. Again crowds gathered around Him, and again, as usual, He taught them. Some Pharisees came up and tried to trap Him by asking, Does the Torah permit a man to divorce his wife? He replied, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to hand his wife a get and divorce her. But Yeshua said to them, He wrote this commandment for you because of your hard-heartedness. However, at the beginning of creation God made the male and female. For this reason a man should leave his father and mother and be united with his wife, and the two are to become one flesh. Thus they are no longer two, but one. So then no one should break apart what God has joined together. And when they were indoors once more, the disciples asked Him about this, and He said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against his wife. And if a wife divorces her husband and marries another man, she too commits adultery. Now, at first account, uh, rather at first glance, these accounts are generally the same. However, there are some key differences from Matthew, and I'll address them as we encounter them. Returning to Matthew now. Now, since his destination was Judea, why cross to the other side of the Sea of Galilee and walk down the east side of the Jordan River? Simply put, Yeshua didn't want to travel through Samaria. The Jews of that day had a little regard for and some actual hatred of Samaria, and of, therefore of the Samarians. Now, Samarians, also called Samaritans, were a mixed population of Gentiles, Jews, and Jews that were married to Gentiles. And so they bore what Jews would have considered half breed children. There were also small cells of various of the so called ten lost tribes living there, as they had for nearly eight centuries. And apparently, they did not practice the kind of the official Judaism of that era, even having their own separate temple and priesthood. Now, we discussed in earlier lessons that Jesus taught that in some measure appearances matter. He didn't and we can't just do things in some strict adherence as we see it to our faith beliefs in disregard of our cultural norms. Naturally, we are not to disobey the Torah or break a biblical moral law. But we also have to pay attention to our cultural norms and tradition that helps to define our society, or we're going to be cast 
as outsiders and be ineffective in reaching others with the good news. Now, while I have no doubt that he harbored no personal ill will against the Samaritans, and, and in fact, on his God on earth, he loved them, it would have made him an even more controversial figure among Jews than he already was if he as much as walked through Samaritan territory to get to Judea. Because Jews, especially Galileans, avoided Samaria like the plague. So Yeshua took the longer route from the Galilee that wound along the east side of the Jordan River, and then it crossed over probably somewhere near Jericho, all right, where John the Baptist had been known to operate. Now we're told that large crowds followed him. Now the route he took from the Galilee to, Ju to Judea went through the district of Perea that was not taboo for Jews. So many Jews lived there. Christ's reputation as a miracle healer had spread far and wide. And so wherever he went, throngs of people followed him that needed healing of every sort. Matthew remarks that Yeshua indeed healed them, which He always did, since His heart was always for the hurting and the lame and the sick and the downtrodden. Now here we encounter our first difference between Matthew and Mark. In Matthew, Christ healed. In Mark, Christ taught. I suspect He did both. It's only that with each gospel the writer chose to highlight one over the other and not both. So whereas most Bible commentators see this difference as a conflict of what happened, I see no such thing. It's simply an issue of the writer's perspective and his emphasis. I'm going to remind you, Matthew was writing from a believing Jewish perspective with an intended audience of believing Jews. Mark was writing from a perspective addressing, of addressing a Gentile audience, and this had much to do with what they each chose to focus on. In the complete Jewish Bible, verse 2 says that some Pharisees who always seemed to mingle in with the, the common folk that followed Yeshua tried to trap Him with a question about divorce. Some Bible versions say test, others say tempt. The Greek word is peirazo, and the Greek lexicons say that it means to test someone or something, usually by trying to ascertain what a person is thinking about something. Therefore, I think the complete Jewish Bible saying they were trying to trap Jesus is a bit off the mark, because that word for us carries an ominous tone to it. What the Pharisees were really trying to determine was something rather legitimate in that day. Was Christ's view of divorce in line with the school of Hillel or with the school of Shammai? See, the one view is something that we could probably call liberal, the other more strict or fundamentalist. Generally speaking, the Pharisees went along with Hillel's teaching on divorce, which was the more liberal. That is, Hillel's halakha, Jewish law, tradition, was that there were several legitimate reasons for divorce, while Shammai's halakha was that there was only one. And Mark and Matthew also differ on this. Mark has it as a very broad question that the Pharisees asked, is it lawful to permit a man to divorce his wife? Matthew adds a qualifier to that question. He says the question is, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife on any ground whatsoever? Different Bible versions word this slightly differently from one another, but they all amount to the same thing. See, the question is, that set before Christ, can there be many different reasons to divorce a wife? That's the issue. 
there is an important nuance for us to notice. In both Mark and Matthew, the word lawful, is it lawful, is it permitted, is in Greek, exesti. The complete Jewish Bible assumes that lawful means Torah law, but I have my doubts about that. I think it means it the way most Jews would have seen it. It means lawful in the sense of permitting according to the halakha of that day, as a representative interpretation of the Torah. Okay, in other words, just as today, when a layman might ask a pastor a theological question, the pastor is typically going to answer based upon his denomination's doctrines, not necessarily what the Bible strictly says, or maybe it will be a combination of both. So then, knowing this, Jesus responds in this way. In Matthew 19, verses 4 and 5, He says, Haven't you read that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female, and that He said, For this reason a man should leave his father and mother, be united with his wife, and the two become one flesh. So Yeshua says, the answer to this question must necessarily go back to the time of Adam and Eve, long before there was a written Torah or Law of Moses. This does not mean that the Law of Moses didn't have a divorce clause. De Deuteronomy 24 speaks of it. Deuteronomy 24, starting at verse 1, Suppose a man marries a woman and consummates the marriage, but later finds her displeasing because he found her offensive in some respect. He writes her a divorce document, gives it to her, sends her away from his house. She leaves his house, goes, and becomes another man's wife. But the second husband dislikes her and writes her again, gives it to her, sends her away from his house, or the second husband whom she married dies. In such a case, her first husband who sent her away may not take her again as a wife, because now she's defiled. It would be detestable to Adonai, and you are not to bring about sin in the land of Adonai your God is giving you as your inheritance. Now we're not going to deal with all the multiple aspects of divorce and Deuteronomy 24 law, because it goes beyond this. But you can go to TorahClass.com and find some in-depth teaching on it. The point is, divorce is indeed part of the Law of Moses, but it can only be applied narrowly, not broadly. What Yeshua says also raises the issue of monogamy. Thus says Christ, the two, male and female, become one, so no one should split apart what God has joined together. Yeshua is quoting from two places in, in Genesis. First of all, Genesis 1.27, So God created humankind in His own image. In the image of God He created them. Male and female He created them. And then Genesis 2.24, this is why a man is to leave his father and mother and stick with his wife, and they're to become one flesh. So, marriage, divorce, and monogamy get all wrapped up together as something that cannot be understood properly without considering them all. The Genesis versions, and thus Jesus, also gets specific about what marriage amounts to. A man and a woman leaving their parents and becoming joined together as a couple. That's marriage. It pains me to have to emphasize the obvious. From a biblical standpoint, from God's standpoint, marriage is exclusively between a male and a female. Gay marriage is an oxymoron. From the biblical perspective. I'm sure this will get removed from the internet someday. And of course, it's but a modern Western civilization attempt to subvert and destroy the God ordained institution and purpose of marriage, which is what? To be fruitful and multiply. 
please notice that Yeshua quoted the Torah as His answer. Don't let that go by you. He quoted the Torah as His answer. Thus, continuing the proof of Matthew 5, 17-19, He didn't come to abolish or destroy the Law of Moses, but rather to uphold it, to teach it, to demonstrate the spirit of the Law as opposed to mechanical obedience to it, and how it ought to look in application. In response to Christ's words, the Pharisees ask, Well, if all that's so, why did Moses give the commandment that a man could divorce his wife if he gave her a get? A get's a Hebrew divorce document. Now again, I want to stress, there is nothing ominous or against Jesus going on here. The subject he's dealing with, they're dealing with, was a raging debate during the first century in the Jewish faith. So Jesus wasn't going to get in trouble no matter how He might have answered. Naturally, the Pharisees wanted Him to believe and to teach their viewpoint and agree with their traditions on the matter, but there would have been no penalty other than their growing disdain for Him if Yeshua taught otherwise, and in fact, He did teach otherwise. Yeshua agreed with Shammai's stricter code for divorce as the standard, and not the Pharisees' more liberal approach. Christ answers the Pharisees' quite reasonable inquiry of His stance about divorce with the words, in verse 8, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives because your hearts are so hardened. This is not how it was at the beginning. See, Yeshua is explaining, I may be better, he's properly interpreting the Deuteronomy 24 passage about marriage, divorce, and possible remarriage. What he says is, of course, true. But it hit the Pharisees square in the face like a, like a cream pie thrown at them. Because he says it's the fault of the hardened hearts of God's people that a system of divorce was even necessary. So in addition to Jesus saying that He has adopted the Pharisees' rival's position on divorce, He is also saying that divorce was only allowed by God due to hardened hearts, sin, and it therefore makes the Pharisees' position on the matter a result of their own hardened hearts to allow such liberal use of the Law of Divorce. I want to clear up something, because grasping the nuances of the Hebrew mindset is critical in interpreting the New Testament. When the Jews, including Jesus, say things like, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives because, see the reference to Moses making the Law or command was just a colloquial way of speaking. That is, it was understood that God gave the laws and commands to Moses, who created, who then wrote them down. There's no implication that it was Moses who created the laws and commandments. From the time the law was given to Moses until his death, Moses was more or less God's scribe and the supreme earthly judge presiding over the law that God gave to Israel. Just as Christians call the legal section of the Torah the Law of Moses, so did the Hebrews of every age. Thus for Israel the term, the Law of Moses, was often abbreviated to just Moses, since Moses was the mediator of it. Now verse 9 makes Yeshua's position on divorce unequivocal. Only on account of sexual immorality unfaithfulness in marriage was divorce legitimate in God's eyes. He has essentially spoken Shammai's halakha on the matter. So the Pharisees would not have walked away very happy about what Yeshua said. 
But his statement then does something that I'm sure upset all the males listening, just as it might upset many males listening to me right now. If a man divorces his wife for any reason other than she's been sexually unfaithful to him, and then the man remarries, the man becomes guilty of adultery. This is a man who divorces his wife because of her infidelity, then he remarries, does so legally and without consequence in God's eyes. By no means does this mean the divorce still wasn't permitted for other reasons. But all those other reasons for divorce bring a dire consequence upon the man who divorces his wife and then remarries. God declares him guilty of adultery. The Hebrews always had a hard time accepting and obeying this, just as Christians do, because no one wants to live a lifetime in an unhappy marriage. Look, we need to grasp that Yeshua was not reading more into Deuteronomy 24 than was there, and thus elevating the law stance on divorce to a higher and more rigid level that He favored. Rather, it was because He well understood the Pharisees' liberalized doctrine on divorce that He used the words and examples that He did. He wanted to expose that while the Pharisees walked around claiming to be the righteous upholders of the Law of Moses, in fact, they tended to ignore the Law on the difficult matters, often taking the more populist view and following their tradition instead. They saw themselves as men of the people, so they made religious rulings holocaust, that were more well-liked by the majority of the common folks. They preferred their traditions that often stretched and twisted and contorted God's laws like silly putty in order to increase their status and to gain approval of the people. Without apology, I can say that the church in general has followed suit. But of course, with our own but different traditions that equally distort God's law, God's laws and commands, or most often just simply throw them all out wholesale. Now we can understand, with all this we can understand why an unnamed one of Christ's disciples, after hearing this conversation, says, you know, seems when one understands the severity of the consequences of divorce, it must be better to not marry at all. Why? Because the many flexible reasons for divorce that the Pharisees preached and that the twelve disciples had up to now accepted as the norm, man, that just suddenly evaporated. This made getting married a far more precarious matter because getting out of a marriage a man no longer wanted was now understood as having pretty serious consequences. And yet it seems at every turn we're confronted with still another, another fact about divorce and marriage. So if one divorces his wife for her adultery, is he actually free to marry again? While there is an implication that it is, that question is not directly answered. Various rabbis and Christian theologians return different answers, looking upon what was no, ba- no, no, no doubt a batch of frowns and perplexed, perplexed faces. Christ says that not everyone grasps this teaching only for those whom it is meant. Translation, this is a very hard teaching, and it goes against centuries of Jewish custom and tradition. Good luck trying to work against it. But it also is something that is reminiscent that Yeshua said back in Matthew chapter 13. Back in Matthew chapter 13, 11, it says, He answered, Because it has been given to you 
to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but it has not been given to them. Knowing the secrets to the kingdom of heaven are reserved only for the members of the kingdom. But that hardly means that every member of the kingdom grasps these secrets equally. Like everything else about our faith, it takes time and experience to mature in it. One cannot expect a new believer to know the many mysteries of the kingdom the way an elder will. And not every secret understanding is going to sit well with us. Marriage and divorce is one of these because in many cases it just flat goes against what we want that we think will make us happier. Being single was not the norm for an adult Jewish male. And I imagine in some ways it made Jesus stand out because He was around 30 years old and not married. So in some ways He's justifying His personal decision not to marry. He lists some reasons, certainly not an exhaustive list, why a man might choose not to marry. Some because they just don't want to. Others because they were, sadly, made into eunuchs to serve a master. Some did so for religious reasons, dedicating their lives to their faith. And thus marriage would be both a personal hindrance and also unfair to a wife. Yeshua repeats that only some to who He is speaking will understand this teaching and point of view. Now I have no doubt that just like in our time, men of Yeshua's generation looked around their society. They saw the many unhappy marriages, the wreckage of lives and families, especially of women's and children's that divorce caused, and decided, no thanks. Mm -mm. The more devout, no doubt worried that certain temptations that would arise once a man made a marriage commitment to a woman, that of itself added some temptations to sin that weren't there before marriage. The difference between then and now is that Jewish men and women of that day didn't, generally didn't just cohabitate as an alternative. The shame would have been too great. Today the number of unmarried couples living together is rising at an alarming rate, and Western society doesn't even blink at it. Since marriage has moved from the religious realm to the secular and governmental realm, then it has become mostly a financial issue. Young couples don't want their finances to be affected since in the Western world it is finances that is at the heart of divorce details, along with the disposition of the offspring. That is, for many of them in the modern era it is better to just live together, keep the finances separate, and one has decided to move on to greener pastures, you just hire a moving truck. No commitment, no further damage done. There's no thought of God's commandments and laws on this subject. Paul had things to say about marriage as well, with one eye towards the specter of divorce. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, we read this. If you want to take a minute to turn there, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to read 16 verses. First Corinthians chapter 7, starting at verse 1. Now, to deal with the questions you wrote about, is it good for a man to keep away from women? Well, because of the danger of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give his wife what she's entitled to in the marriage relationship, and the wife should do the same for her husband. The wife is not in charge of her own body, 
but her husband is. Likewise, the husband is not in charge of his own body, but his wife is. Do not deprive each other, except for a limited time by mutual agreement, and then only so as to have extra time for prayer. But afterwards, come together again. Otherwise, because of your lack of self-control, you may succumb to the adversary's temptation. And I'm giving you this as a suggestion, not as a command. Actually, I wish everyone were like me, but each has his own gift from God. One this, another that. Now, to the single people and to the widows, I say, it is fine if they remain unmarried like me, but if they can't exercise self-control, they should get married because it is better to get married than to keep burning with sexual desire. To those who are married I have a command, and it is not from me, but from the Lord. A woman is not to separate herself from her husband, but if she does separate herself, she is to remain single or be reconciled with her husband. Also a husband is not to leave his wife. Now to the rest I say, I, not the Lord, if any brother has a wife who is not a believer, and she is satisfied to go on living with him, he should not leave her. Also, if any woman has an unbelieving husband who is satisfied to go on living with her, she is not to leave him. But for the unbelieving husband has has been set aside for God by the wife, and the unbelieving wife has been set aside for God by the brother, otherwise your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are set aside for God. But if the unbelieving spouse separates himself, let him be separated. In circumstances like these, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to a life of peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Now, I'm not going to really teach on what Paul said, but rather what Matthew and Mark said, so we're not going to get into every detail of Paul's narrative. I had us read this in order that we notice how complex the matter of marriage and divorce had become later in the first century. Believing in and following Yeshua in some ways added to the complication. Yet, if we listen to what Yeshua said in Matthew 19, it should only simplify. The matter of marriage for a believer can be so fraught with dangers of sinning that Paul outright says he wishes every believing male would be like him, choosing not to marry. Of course, that also assumes celibacy, which our modern Western cultural world says is puritanical, if not stupid. Okay, I want to embellish a little on this teaching about marriage and divorce and monogamy. The the expansive subject of marriage, divorce, monogamy, and even celibacy, it, it loomed large in the first century, perhaps even larger now. To understand the biblical view and Yeshua's view of it, we need to understand what all this meant to the Jews of the first century because the context in which it was taught is how we need to take it. There were numerous viewpoints about these topics in the first century. I've already mentioned the Pharisees, Hillel and Shammai, their views, but there were others as well, such as that of the Essenes, who, as near as we can tell from the Dead Sea Scroll documents, allowed no divorce for any reason. So in a kind of Paul-like view, or maybe Paul had adopted the Essen view, male Essens usually shunned marriage for the sake of not sinning, although marriage was by no means outlawed by the Essens. So important to realize that the majority of marriages in Jewish society that then were what we might call arranged marriages. And that was because the girl was usually quite young when it happened. Being only 12 or 13, it was not unusual for a girl to be betrothed to a man she likely didn't even know at her father's decision. 
Partly this is because money was involved. At other times, one party in the arrangement might have held a higher social status that allowed the more common family to be elevated up into it, if such a marriage could be arranged. A girl, a maiden, or more commonly called in the Bible vernacular, a virgin, was transferred from being under the authority of her father immediately to the authority of her husband. Unless the girl was of a much more advanced age, she had no choice in the matter. Now, Despite what can seem to us as harsh rules for marriage and divorce, it was actually mostly for the benefit of the woman. Not until later in time could a woman divorce a man. It was a one-way street. And that's why we see the divorce laws worded the way they were. It was not if a man displeased a woman that she had grounds for divorce. It was only if a woman displeased a man. And what amounted to unfaithfulness in marriage was quite different for a woman than it was for a man. Unfaithfulness was expanded for a woman to mean perhaps she wasn't a good enough housekeeper to please her husband. Or maybe she was unable to have children. Or she had some disability that didn't enable her to do the work or her marital duties expected of a wife. None of this applied to a man. If he was unable to or unwilling to perform his marital duties or support the family, then the wife and the children suffered with no recourse. If he was abusive, she couldn't leave him. So the divorce laws were meant to help with this situation. The requirement of the law for a husband to give his wife a get, a divorce document, see that freed her from the control of and authority of her husband. This was the official get out of jail card. Often this meant giving her the ability now to return to her father's household and his authority. Only in the rarest of cases could a woman divorce her husband. Divorce was entirely in the hands of a male. And as much as not, the underlying reason that women were stuck in a bad marriage was because in the biblical era an unmarried adult woman not living under her father's roof would likely be in poverty because men held down most of the paying jobs. Divorce could mean real deprivation for the female. It is interesting to me how Yeshua clearly veers off from divorce and into the issue of polygamy versus monogamy. Now, while it, that isn't all that apparent to us, it would have been to his Jewish listeners. Now, while we really don't have any strong evidence one way or the other into how widespread the practice of polygamy was in his day, the evidence is clear. It existed in Jewish society, but probably, interestingly, not outside the Holy Land. See, this is because Roman law prohibited it in their empire, although they made many exceptions for the former Israelite territories and the Jewish people. Now, it might surprise some believers, but the law of Moses actually allowed polygamy, although it didn't advocate for it. Exodus chapter 21 of the Torah presents a series of rulings given by God through Moses. In verse 10 we read, if he marries another wife, he's not to reduce her food, clothing, or marital rights. So the thought here is a protection for the woman who becomes a man's second wife. She's to be not to be provided for any less than his first wife. In Deuteronomy we read, Deuteronomy 21, verses 15-17 through 17, If a man has two wives, 
the one loved and the other unloved, and both the loved and unloved wives have borne him children. And if the firstborn son is the child of the unloved wife, then when it comes time for him to pass his inheritance on to his sons, he may not give the inheritance due the firstborn to the son of the loved wife, in place of the son of the unloved one, who is in fact the firstborn. No, he must acknowledge his firstborn son of the unloved wife by giving him a double portion of everything he owns, for he is the first fruits of his manhood, and the right of the firstborn is his. So while this passage is structured around a man having two wives, one whom he's happy with, the other that he's not, the issue is, what about the children each wife is born? And what about the firstborn? which were always males, when conditions change, such as death or divorce. See, this matter is critical for the well-being of the wives as it is for the sons and the other children, because if a wife was either widowed or divorced, her only hope for a decent life lay in the existence of a son to care for her. My point is that polygamy was not only tolerated, it was planned for. Yet do not think that anywhere in the Torah is polygamy recommended. Rather, it is something that God knew would continue to exist, and so He commanded what must be done to protect the women and the children. I mean, what Bible student doesn't know? That the forefather of the entire human, uh, rather the entire Hebrew race, Abraham, had not only multiple wives but also concubines, as did his son Isaac and grandson Jacob after him. King David had multiple wives, and yet he was very dear to God's heart. So, what we must be careful to do with such issues as marriage, divorce, and polygamy versus monogamy is to separate. God's ideal will from what God in His mercy makes provision for, for the fallen and perverted human race. In fact, in the Old Testament, polygamy is most often related to the first wife not being able to bear children. And even when that's not the case, <laughs> We read of trouble after trouble, headache after headache that comes from it, especially from the offspring, with the consequences often bleeding into future generations. When we arrived in the first century, polygamy has mostly died out among the Jews, partly due to the Roman influence, but also because of the sheer financial burden of it. Most men simply couldn't afford more than one wife. It's very interesting that information found within the Dead Sea Scrolls sheds light on the matter of polygamy during Jesus' day. We learn from it that Essens firmly rejected polygamy. But what is interesting, so interesting, is what they had to say about the Pharisees' thought about polygamy. Keep in mind that the Essens and the Pharisees were, at the least, rivals. Their doctrines were very different, see, because while the Essens' goal was to shuck off the centuries of man-made traditions that now ruled the Jewish faith, and in so doing return to something more pure, closer to the Law of Moses, the Pharisees embraced those man-made traditions, and they seemed to make more of them every day, taking them farther and farther away from the Law of Moses. Now I want to quote this Dead Sea Scrolls passage to you, because it is within this context that it helps us to understand why Yeshua took the topic of divorce that the Pharisees confronted him with, and essentially moved it towards an argument for monogamous marriage. Seems that in the so-called Damascus documents, 
which are part of the Dead Sea Scrolls. <clears throat> the Essens have two articles of denunciation for the Pharisees for their allowed practice of polygamy, something the Essens saw as evil and definite sexual immorality. Here is one of them. Now, this is a quote from that ancient document. They, the Pharisees, are caught by two snares, by sexual sin, namely taking two wives in their lives, while the foundation of creation is male and female, He created them, and those who entered Noah's ark went in two by two into the ark, and of the prince it is written, Let him not multiply wives for himself. And David did not read, <laughs> this is funny, David did not read the sealed book of the Torah which was in the Ark of the Covenant, for it was not opened in Israel until the day of the death of Eleazar and Joshua and the elders, for their successors worshipped the Ashtoreth, and that which was revealed was hidden until Sadok arose, so David's works were accepted and God forgave him for them. You catch this? We can spend a lot of time with this passage. But the point is that the essence saw that the Pharisees, that's the they in this passage, were caught in a snare of their own making. That is, their traditions were the snare, and this caused the polygamy, the accepted polygamy. This snare, a stumbling block, was the sex sin of allowing a man to have two wives, and just as D Jesus did in Matthew 19. The Essens argued their point beginning with the act of creation. Interesting. A time before the Law of Moses came into being. A time when God created two people, a man and a woman. Now, I can't go by without commenting how the Essens also found a way to make the polygamist King David innocent on the grounds that the sealed book, I was talking about here, taken to mean the book of Deuteronomy, wasn't available to him, because it was locked inside the Ark of the Covenant, which he dare not open, so he was ignorant of God's ideal of a man having only one wife. <laughs> Pretty good. Well, the other article of denunciation against polygamy itself, less so directed against the Pharisees, comes from their interpretation in Midrash of Leviticus 18.18. 18. This same argument against polygamy is used in another of the Dead Sea Scrolls documents called the Temple Scroll. It goes like this, Leviticus 18.18 18 from the Complete Jewish Bible says, You are not to take a woman to be a rival, to be a rival with her sister and have sexual relations with her while her sister is still alive. Now the essence interpreted this differently. The Hebrew word for sister is achot. However, it is now known that in biblical Hebrew of that day, that achot could be used for meaning a sister, or it could mean other or a, another of the female gender, somebody else but a female. The word sister was often used as meaning a fellow female Israelite, just like Christians will sometimes refer to a female believer as a sister, when in fact no familial relationships intended. So, perhaps a better reading of Leviticus 18.18 18, that really makes the most sense is how the essence took it. Now please listen carefully. They say it should read, it should be interpreted as, and he shall not take another wife, for she alone will be with him all the days of her life. What I'm telling you is not my opinion. Rather, it is how the writers of both the Damascus document and the Temple Scroll from Christ's day and some days before took Leviticus 18.18 18 to mean. It was for them a decisive argument in favor of monogamy. In any case, this must be taken as the background in Matthew to explain why 
Yeshua sort of oddly devolved into the issue of marital monogamy since that's not what He was asked about. Rather it was that He was talking to religious authorities, Pharisees, who accepted polygamy, you see, as godly, and He wanted to use this opportunity to straighten them out. Christ was a pragmatist. He wasn't an idealist. He dealt with the real issues of His time, not a series of hypothetical issues. See, it's when we lift Him out of that pragmatic approach, when we take Him out of His Jewishness, that Christian teachers regularly spiritualize what He says, and so His teachings become this maze of allegorical sermons with different outcomes. We're not quite finished with the issues of marriage, divorce, celibacy, and monogamy yet. So that's what we'll continue with next week. Thank you.